Welcome to CraneWorks training segment titled Fun with Fuses. Today you're going to learn how to test fuses, what causes fuses to blow, and we're going to reinforce the cardinal rule with you that cranes never fail because of a broken or bad fuse. Let's start by talking about the cardinal rule. Fuses are never the problem that causes a crane to fail. It's simply, they are simply a symptom of a problem with wiring or different electrical components within the crane that are drawing over current. A fuse acts as a guardian. It actually opens the gate when there is an issue with too high a current that might damage other equipment in, within the crane. So they never blow or fail on their own. Some event, such as high current, draw, or shorts, those types of things, cause the fuse to open and to uh, protect the system at that time, acts as the guardian. Now I would like to invite Professor Gary to come up and to discuss with us the different types of fuses and how they are constructed. Hi, my name's Gary. Today we're talking fuses. Number one thing above all else is be safe. Safety glasses all the time. All kidding aside, um, crane works. Safety is our number one thing. We don't want anyone being hurt. So remember your lockout tag out. Remember safety glasses all the time when you're doing electrical work. So we're going to go on and talk with fuses. Okay. You know, there are literally dozens and dozens of different types of fuses out there. They come in all shapes, sizes, colors. Uh, you know, like this is a Limitron. It's a quick-acting, current-limiting fuse. But today, primarily, we're going to talk about fuses that we use for to protect motors and electrical wiring. And that's... FRS, FRN type, slow blow, uh, dual element fuses. They're dual element because inside the fuse there is one section that goes pretty slowly and is just protecting for overload. There is another section in series with it that is really fast that protects for short circuits and for grounds. So that being aside, let's get this junk out of the way. F, these are all FRN fuses, 600 volt max. You can use them on any voltage below, but FRN, 600 volt max. Here's a 30 amp, and you'll see it's smaller than a 60, which is smaller than a 100, which is smaller than a 200, which is smaller than this old 400 here. So, any fuse that's under 30 amps will fit in this holder. As soon as we go to 31 or 35 amps, you're got, you have to go to this size. It takes a 60 amp disconnect to hold this fuse. You can fuse it at 35 amps, but you're in this, this size fuse. Then you, same thing when you go to, to, I need 65 amps, it's going to put me in a 100 amp frame, 100 amp disconnect. If I need 125 amps, well, I have to go into a 200 amp disconnect. And if I need 225 amps, well, I'm up in a 400 amp disconnect. So that's what these are all about. You'll notice the length gets taller as the amps go up. On FRS, the same thing holds true, but all these fuses get shorter. FRS is a maximum of 300 volts. We're going to use them on 208 volt systems, 240 volt systems. You'll notice that that these fuses are all different colors depending on the manufacturer they come they look different here's a a uh, hundred amp fuse well it's 175 amp fuse but you'll notice that it's way shorter but the the copper length of the bar is identical both of these go in a 200 amp switch here's a a 60 amp fuse, but if we're out in the field and we only have a 100 amp switch, it's already in place, well we can put adapters on it 
and now it fits into a 100 amp switch. So, that being said, FRS, FRN, uh, as you change manufacturers, the, the, the FRS may change. Like this uh, is a Shamut fuse, it's a TRS60. The R means rejection, that's the rejection clip. On these, it's this little hole. Those are there so if the, if the switch is properly set up that you don't install some other type of fuse. So, we know what fuses we're going to use. Now let's see about troubleshooting. You know, what, how do we tell when a fuse is bad? What made it fail? Okay, we're back. Now we're going to do a little troubleshooting. You, let's make the scenario that you've been called down to a customer. He says, I've been blowing fuses. Here's a spare fuse. Put it in. I've already pulled the uh, bad one out and uh, tell me what's wrong. So before you go install this fuse you handed him, make sure that it's good. And we can put our, our voltmeter on ohms and we check it across the fuse. And it better shows zero. And we are. We're zero ohms. That's what we want. Any number other than zero, the fuse is already bad. So it's you know with a with the fuse, if it were blown, it'll actually show open like this. This meter will say oh well. But it shows that we first we want to make a good electrical connection with our meter and it's zero and that's what we want so we can make sure our power is off we go to our switch and before I reach in there let's make sure power is off and we measure our voltage face to face oh let's put this on both And we actually are zero. This meter, you'll see it's showing eight volts even in free air right now. It takes a minute to settle down. But we're zero. So we can pull our fuses, put our new fuse in, and we turn it on. And you want to stand, you really want to shut the door and stand to the side. If there is a short or a, uh, a fault to ground, you could pull so many amps that this thing explodes, so stay to the side. We use our screwdriver to get our, our, our deep, deep feet and away we go. Now we check. We check our voltage. Well, first we check our amps, and if if we read, we have no load, so we're, if we read amps here, zero in amps here, it's telling us there's a problem. So then we switch to our voltmeter. We have our 440 here. And we have our 440 here. Now we don't have our 440. So we've got a problem. We can turn around and say, oh hell, we have 440 volts across the fuse. That can't be. So that fuse is already bad. That's because on this particular circuit we're feeding, there's some piece of equipment that is letting energy come around back to the bottom side of the fuse. Not all circuits have that uh, kind of uh, reaction, but this one, I know there's a transformer sitting, a control transformer wired up, and that's why we're reading this voltage here. Because line to line, we're showing nothing. This will disappear eventually. 
So anyway, we don't have voltage here. And we don't have voltage here. We have voltage line to line, line to line. And we can also check line to ground. And this system doesn't show really anything on it. So it's an ungrounded system. Uh, in some buildings, you'll see 277 volts line to ground. But anyway, we know we've got a bad fuse, so we turn off power. And we pull our fuse. We pull the bad fuse, and let's use fuse pullers if we can. And we're we were well, we pulled this out, and one thing you want to make sure is where the clips tight. When we're changing fuses, that's important. We can also check the other two. <clears throat> yeah, that's plenty tight. And so is this one. They're nice and tight. If they slid out, just slid on their own, then there's a problem with the, with the fuse clips. So we take our bad fuse and we put our new fuse in. Yeah. Let's make your voltage. Make sure again. We're dead, so I'm going to put this in by hand. Okay, we have new fuses in. They're nice and tight. Again, you want to shut the door if possible. We'll take our screwdriver and I'm going to defeat this. And we want to check our amps. All three amps are flowing, so let's check our voltage. We want to check A to B, B to C, and C to A. And we have voltage coming out. It's the same as our input. So we're good to go. The fuses are tight. The wires look good. We, if we have burned wires or clips that are green and black and burned, uh, we got to do something about that. Loose clips, you just can't leave them loose. They actually even make little clamps that you can put on to tighten them up. So they have to be tight. But we're on. Uh, the one thing we note, here are three fuses that look vastly different. But this is FRSR 100. This is FRSR 100. These are different age fuses. Same manufacturer. And here's a little fuse. Looks completely different. Uh, DSR 100. And it says time delay dual element. It's the same kind of fuse. It has a little window. And that window, if it turns black, it's telling us that fuse is bad. So, anyway, we have our power coming out. We've measured amps. We're ready to close the door and turn this back over to the customer. So, fuses aren't tough, but you want to do it the right way. And again, every time, safety glasses, be safe. Before you reach in, measure it with a voltmeter, both face to face, all three phases to each other and to ground before you reach in and take the chance of electrocuting yourself. So good luck, good troubleshooting. Well, we're back. Let's talk a, a, a couple more reasons why fuses blow. You know, we talked about loose fuse clips. We talked about bad electrical connections that get hot. Uh, we talked, we said overload. Well, a lot of things cause overload. 
Overload could be a guide that's hooked on with a hoist to something that's just way too heavy that you're pulling too many amps. The overload though could also be, oh this is a convenient place that I need power and they hook a welder up downstream and they're pulling, the, he's welding, he's pulling power along with your crane or whatever else is on there and that could be taking you over the limit of the fuse. These fuses, uh, a 100 amp fuse that what we have in here, uh, at 200 percent overload will take about three minutes to blow. So it, do, it doesn't happen fast, it happens over time. The, that's the dual element portion of this fuse. The slow blow part is, okay, we're overloaded a little bit, all electric motors pull five to seven times a nameplate when they start. And you want to, so you don't want a, a fuse blowing because you're going over it when you're starting because the, the motor drops down to its lower amperage as it's running. So if you're overloaded, it takes a while for these to blow. But if you have a dead short, uh, somebody puts your, your collector rails go together. You can pull thousands of amps. These will blow in as little as a hundredth of a second. Uh, so you've got that two ends of the spectrum. One line going to ground can give you a fault and it, it will go out in a hundredth of a second if it's a good solid fault connection. So when we talk overload also, you may blow one fuse or you may blow two or you may blow all three. That comes down to to each fuse, its characteristics, they're not identical. And uh, don't get fooled when you go out on a job site if it's, let's say this center fuse blows. You check it, you put a new fuse in. We want to check it electrically. Make sure that you have all three phases and that you have amps on all three. Because if, if the guy wasn't paying any attention and he puts a fusible disconnect over at the main service that he's running out to this crane, but at the crane they put up another fusible disconnect and they're both fused the same. You may blow one fuse in this disconnect and another fuse in the other disconnect. So that, can, that uh, screws a lot of people up because they didn't go back in with a voltmeter. They'll throw a fuse in and say, oh, we're fixed. You turn it on. Well, you're still single phasing everything. And that single phasing makes this stuff get hot again. Remember on a motor, and let's make the numbers easy. A 10 amp motor, if you lose one phase, if it's already at full load pulling 10 amps and you lose a phase, the remaining two phases go up to 17 amps. So 17 amps. On a, on a small fuse, it may take minutes before you actually lose the fuse. Hopefully your overload will take you out because they're supposed to be acting faster as far as the motor current. So I'm back. Single phasing. What causes single phasing? Single phasing can be the loss of a fuse. It can be a wire nut that fell off in the junction box of the motor and you lost a phase there. Single phasing can be a contact in the starter that is blown into. Single phasing can be caused by an, an overload uh, relay in the motor where the heater has blown off or blown into. All of those give us a single phase condition and when we talk single phase, you know, the, the motors have three phases going to them so you get three different voltages. You get the A to B, the B to C, and the C to A voltage. When we lose a phase, you only get the B to C. So that's why it's single phasing. You're only getting two wires, that's one phase. It takes three hot wires to give you three phases. So when you single phase, um, you know, motors that are running, if, you, if something happens and you lose a fuse, They'll continue, they may continue to run, 
the probability on a hoist is that they'll stop. Uh, a single phase condition on a on a a hoist, it may let you drop a load, may let the motor run down, but it won't let you go up. That's a good indication that we're single phasing the motor. But it shows up instantly on amps at your control panel. You want to measure amps. The A phase has to be equal to the B phase, which has, which has, which has to be equal to the C phase. So lots of things can cause single phasing. And it doesn't mean we have a bad fuse. The fuse may be a result if on a hoist motor, and let's make it a, a big motor that's already uh, rated uh, 100 amps. We'll make it a big motor, 100 horse lift motor. You lose, a, you lose a, a fuse and the motor's running down, or you lose a phase, a starter contact blows up. Your other two phases will go to 173 amps. That'll eventually make the other one of the other or both of the other fuses blow. But when you go into the up condition, that motor won't start. It won't have an, it doesn't have a, any starting torque. So you don't go to 73% more current, you go to locked rotor current five to seven times. So that motor, instead of being 100, 100 amps, is now 500 amps or 700 amps. And that's going to knock those fuses out. So let's, let's just say we've got something simple. We've had a wire come off the connection in the motor junction box. That can make your fuses blow. It can make two fuses blow. So you put fuses in it and walk away and don't put an ammeter on what's going on. It's going to happen again which is annoying to start with, but on top of it, when we're talking these little guys, that's a $10 fuse. That's over $100. So just throwing fuses in is not a good idea. That gets expensive in a hurry. So again, single phasing, make sure that you have all three phases, not just at the disconnect. You, got, you better be in the hoist control panel because your single phase condition down on the floor at the at the runway disconnect may be a shoe off on the runway. That may be the whole problem why you're blowing fuses. It may be a loose wire nut. It may be a starter that's bad. Uh, there's so many places it could be bad. It could just be a crappy connection someplace. So single phasing, uh, it's a simple, simple condition. But single phasing means you've lost current flow in one phase. And that current flow is from here all the way through the whole system out to the motor. If you lose it in any place, you'll make these other two circuits go way up in amps. All right, well, thank you, uh, Professor Gary, for your help today. In summary, Gary t trained us today on the different fuse types and their construction, the proper ways to test fuses, and what causes a fuse to blow. Most important thing, though, is that we've been taught about the cardinal rule, and that is that fuses never blow or fail on their own. Some event had to occur that created where an overcurrent was present that caused a fuse to blow. One final note today to the Crane Works Crane Rangers uh, that are viewing this film. It's very important that if you go on site and discover a fuse blown, but you're not able to determine the reason that that fuse failed, you will need to discuss this with the end user, your customer, and let them know that there must be some intermittent problem that caused that fuse to blow. And for you to troubleshoot that, that problem has to be present and it isn't at this time. So after you've done this, please call your operations manager, let them know that you know what the cardinal rule is, that you found a fuse blown and you can't find the reason why it's blown, and you know something had to cause that, but ask them if there's any other item that they would like you to check on the crane prior to leaving, and then one last time, be sure to explain to the customer that they have an intermittent problem 
that you're not able to determine what it is because it's not causing the problem at this time, and that if it becomes a nuisance, that you may have to start changing some components for them in the future, starting with the most likely component that's bad, wiring, festooning, something like that, and then working your way through the system until you get the nuisance to clear. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss fuses. Remember to be safe and that working on cranes is cool.